Hi all. Hi Michael. Hi, hi Alexandra. We are now live. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> nice to be here. Hello. Nice to see you. Are we the How only ones Miami? here? It's great. It's really warm. It's really beautiful. The temperature is perfect, and you know the energy here is really exciting. I just came in yesterday late afternoon and walked right out into the street and into and into overhearing conversations about art and and in a new way for me about to Basel the conversations about um, crypto and about NFTs and about other kinds of possibilities within that within the space and um, and was at a number of events last night that where that energy was echoed and I've never seen uh, or couldn't imagine the two in the same same space so it seems really really exciting I'm I'm it, it's uh, I'm in a beautiful place and I'm in a very small room but uh, it's, it's exciting all around Hi Daria Hi Hi how's everything Hi Daria Hi right Yeah, just speaking to the Hermitage Museum. One second. How are you, Daria? I'm How good. I'm good. I'm in snowy Moscow. <laughs> we have a proper winter now. Fantastic. I just came from cold New York to sunny and warm, warmer Florida. Oh, it's beautiful. But I miss New York a lot as well. I haven't been since the pandemic has started, oh. and I really miss New York. Hi. Hello, guys. Hi, Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, all. And so... we here with Anastasia. Hi, Anastasia. We're just trying to trying to fit into one window. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I Hello. think uh, we can start our live. Okay. And uh, I will make a short introduction. My name is Alexandra Luzan, and I'm art, art historian and head of partnership at NFT Lab and Marketplace Snark Art. And in Snark, we are working with world famous artists to create groundbreaking projects using blockchain. And we are super excited to see you with us today on our art talk, The NFT Revolution, dedicated today to the first official NFT exhibition in the State Hermitage Museum. And I really hope that it will be our new tradition to organize such art uh, meetings and talks with different artists, museums, art institutions, and influencers in NFT field. So I'm honored today to introduce our guests. Uh, and with us, uh, Dmitry Azirkov, uh, head of State Hermitage uh, Museum's Contemporary Art Division. Uh, Daria Perfinenka, Associate Director and Representative Christie's in Russia and CIS countries and uh, Michael Ju, art, uh, an internationally recognized contemporary artist and co-creator of the NFT project Organic Growth Crystal Reef. So let's start and I pass the floor to Dmitry Zerkov. Yes, um, good evening or good morning everybody. Um, uh, it's a very big pleasure for me to launch this meeting because what we initiated uh, this year was uh, as crazy as uh, it never was, because we decided to create the first ever totally virtual digital exhibition and place it into the Hermitage Museum, one of the largest world museums, and uh, to make it accessible through a virtual gallery and make it totally, totally digital without any relation to the uh, real world. And this initiative uh, created lots of uh, very interesting problems that we were all together deciding, together with artists who are working on different platforms and using different currencies, together with our um, technical teams who were trying to make the exhibition accessible to everybody uh, because you can enter the gallery uh, with your avatar and you can talk to other people in the gallery, you can discuss artworks. And I see now many people from Asia who are visiting the gallery and meeting there and discussing works, uh, especially when we have night in Russia. And um, uh, we also had lots of difficulties uh, to solve during the building of this exhibition together with our partners 
they have incredible partners and I'm sure it will be time to list all of them. And uh, what I want to say is that the last thing we were criticizing was that we are burning lots of energy and we are working against world climate. So at the very last moment, we made, a, made an agreement with a company who would plant trees after the exhibition ends uh, and they will calculate according to a formula how much uh, energy we have consumed and uh, we will plant uh, accordingly trees in order to restitute the damage that the exhibition had done to the world. So uh, I'm very, very happy we, we launched and I pass now the camera to Anastasia, the co-curator who has fantastic Nick Digital Madonna <laughs> that she will sell many years after for huge money. And uh, Nasty, please say a few words. Yeah, so thank you. I think we, we could pass the word to the discussion. So I think we can start. And uh, Anastasia, uh, happy birthday to you. I, I know that you have a birthday today. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> And thank you for this wonderful exhibition which you have created with Mitri. So let's start, uh, let's start my calendar. And I just wanted to say to our audience that if you will have any questions, just please write it down and uh, I will try to moderate it. <laughs> thank you and let's start. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity for both Hermitage and Snarkard. I'm really looking forward. I have a lot of questions to you, Michael. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to start a bit biographically and uh, talk about how you started your art journey um, from the beginning, just for the sake of those in the audience who don't really know how it all began. And I know that you didn't initially study art. You come from a science uh, family and you had mainly science as your topic of interest as a child and uh, could you talk a bit about more about that and how that kind of translated how did you get into art and why did you become an artist oh yeah uh, yeah the um you know I, I actually to get a bit autobiographical i uh with my background i actually um grew up in a household of scientists as you mentioned uh, both my parents were um, agricultural scientists my mother was a seed scientist and my father a uh, cattleman um, studying animal breeding and particularly with um, cattle and um, livestock and so i grew up really half between farms and, la and laboratories and, as well as um, you know on ranches and um, and at the edges of, of cities rather than in them and one of the things that was always interesting to me was that my father um, and mother were both had a strong interest in the arts. And so I grew up literally, um, uh, he was an amazing draftsman and, um, you know, we brought it, were brought up around the arts, but surrounded by um, science and a mixture of science and culture. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think it, it's something that I see a lot in your work, both, you know, titles and the, the pieces themselves. And I think science is very much ingrained uh in your uh, practice then when you started art you you got a traditional art education you started working with galleries creating things in the physical realm and both galleries and things the projects like the the soul transfer which i find fascinating because it has so much to do with the energy and the transformation and could you tell a bit more about the uh, soul transfer cycle. Uh, yes, uh, soul transfer cycle has probably a lot to do with um, these ideas of invisible and abstract concepts coming into reality, which is something I think was really profound for me growing up around science and, and in many ways not dissimilar to some of the pursuits of, of contemporary art and, and, and art and culture in general. You know, we're kind of making live and real and felt in some ways abstract concepts, things we feel, things we think things that are intangible coming jumping realm and becoming things that we can relate to. Um, and I think in salt transfer cycle, I was very interested in the idea um, at the time of energy and the idea that energy could be transferred and mutable and, and in many different forms and states. And so um, I also had an interest in um, salt 
and in, in human activity. And so I thought maybe there's a way to show or display and present energy in different states. And so Soul Transfer Cycle uh, was a for performance and video work that um, where I presented myself as a protagonist uh, traveling to the east by going west. And um, uh, the, the video and performance took place in three different stages. First, a, a swim through 2,000 pounds of MSG, or monosodium glutamate, um, at which point the, uh, I was transported to uh, Utah, to the Bonneville Salt Flats, where uh, record-setting uh, automobiles or cars were tested for speed records. So this very linear process um, for one second that would, uh, again, burn out all these energies, but in the pursuit of something that's cyclical, you know, this kind of idea of a, re of a record or something that's kind of, um, that changes all the time. And along the way, um, my body accumulates sweat as a kind of idea of this energy expenditure, uh, performing in a parody of evolution. And as I perform this kind of linear evolution, um, my body becomes covered in salt, uh, at which point I uh, went to the mountains of South Korea and waited for wild elk or rather uh, transplanted um, European elk on uh, growing wild in these uh, mountain ranges to come lick the salt off my body and put that into their bloodstreams. So in a way, it was really the idea of artificiality in the studio, this MSG kind of dream performance. Um, how, do you, how do you take an idea and put it literally into the bloodstream um, of, of nature? Yeah, of an animal, wow. And you do work around nature a lot because you grew up with nature and you work on the balances of, you know, the perfectly imperfect things that you see in nature because with elks, you do a lot of also works on balance uh, with the antlers, uh, right? You had those really beautiful objects where you take something from the nature and you reassemble it to be perfectly balanced. Uh, yes, uh, I think you're talking about these improved rack series yeah, works. And in these works, I was uh, collecting um, elk sheds or sheds of antlers, uh, things that are part of a cycle in the life of this animal, but also things that for me were a gauge, you know, um, almost like a thermometer or some kind of ruler that measures the health of an environment. So I was really interested in objects like this that you know, signify growth, but in their, the way they grow and how they look and how they, their appearance and physical kind of structure um, in many ways tell you how the health of the environment it lives in um, is doing. So finding these elk sheds, which in itself is a very difficult, um, strange task because you know an elk will drop a shed drop one antler and they won't just both fall off there necessarily you know a shed can come off here and then the animal can run away somewhere and try to get the other antler off so the act of bringing these two antlers that have fallen in nature together and then um kind of noting that they are nothing in nature is perfectly balanced and perfectly symmetrical um trying to cut them and segment them and rebalance them according to weight and, and, and visual uh, qualities um, down to the you know, absolute gram to actually create a, a perfectly balanced um, supporting uh, elk rack or, or structure. So in a way, it's um, kind of taking on nature as a, as a found object, as a nature, as a, as a manufacturing um, plant, and then injecting a kind of idea of the willpower, of the gesture to rebalance it, not necessarily to improve it, but just to kind of impose the will on it, and which I think we always try to do when we try to imagine nature. Um, yeah, it, it brings a lot of things in the way we see nature and especially the way we've seen nature throughout the 20th century uh, in terms of us trying to make it better, to change it in a way that we see the, is a more balanced thing. And actually coming back to what Mitri was saying about this project, with NFTs, that quite a few questions in terms of the energy expenditure and sustainability and what are your thoughts in terms of technology and where do you think there are any solutions or are you just looking at what's what's available now and don't have a decision yet oh well, i hope that we're all you know in trying to understand nature better become closer to our environment and i think that um you know utilizing platforms and um ahead of time is a, is, a, is, a, is a great thing that we're aspiring to. 
I think right now the tools we have in order to kind of learn how to get to those points are we're, we're going to have to do a lot of patching. So it's it's very interesting in this NFT space, I think, that um, these communities and with all the transparency and communication and, and out dialogue um, expect more and so are able to give feedback uh, to to kind of improvement and to 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 um, cases where we can do better and find find more interesting platforms um, such as proof of stake or ideas that um, that some of this computational power can not only as so you know admirably has been done by the Hermitage and as Dimitri mm -hmm. mentioned um, retroactively and in response to um, you know I wouldn't call it its criticism yes but in, also in response to feedback. Um, yeah. is this kind of idea of responsiveness and that responsiveness is really interesting. So I find it can either happen at the, at this time, all of those things are, are positive. It's kind of responsive reaction and hopefully we can aspire to a more, um, a state where we understand these things and kind of, um, uh, you know, um, plan ahead in terms of, of mitigating some of those, um, those kinds of, um, uh, energy, energy consumption, excessive energy consumption. Yeah, thank you. And another thing you mentioned is the community. And uh, I'm quite new to the NFT space. I'm, I'm an art historian and usually focused on more traditional works of art, not even contemporary is my main focus. Uh, but one of the things I noticed about NFTs is the community and the strength in the community around it. And I think it's one yes. of the reasons for the success of it. How has your feeling been about this uh, community? Because you uh, you recently came into the NFT space in a way. This OG Crystals, this is your first major NFT project. You did some digital art before, but uh, you're quite new to the NFT. Well, we all are new in a way, but uh, how has your been, uh, feeling been about the community there? Uh, I think the community is, is amazing. I should, I, I'll backtrack just for a second. My, my kind of introduction to NFTs, uh, it in, in many ways starts back in 2017 when I was introduced to the idea of cryptocurrency and, and blockchain by graduate students of mine at, um, at, a, at, a, at a university I, art school that I teach in. And um, it was fascinating to me that they were coming up with really interesting perspectives on, on their, in their work and then um, to learn that uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency was something that they were also getting into really piqued my, my interest I think cutting ahead several years, um, the uh, introduction of you know what artists were doing with blockchain to to me by um, Snark.art and Andy Oiken and Nadia, the curator um, at the platform, um, was really eye-opening in seeing how artists were treating blockchain um, and ideas like fractionalized ownership. Um, really got me thinking at the time. I think the idea of NF, the word and the term NFT wasn't really even in my vocabulary, and that was only you know, a year and a half, two years ago. And um, along that pathway, uh, um, another um, kind of colleague or another a friend of mine, Robert Norton from Verbs Art, um, uh, mentioned and introduced me to the idea of, uh, you know, why don't you try to mint your first NFT? And so really, I had this opportunity um, after meeting um, Andy and Nadia and speaking with Snark.art about the idea of a growing and generative, you know, um, uh, a crystal project. You know, uh, what about in the idea of a, an, an NFT that or a project, a digital art project that didn't sit still, that was something that would evolve over time, you know, something that artwork in many ways couldn't do, physical artwork. Um, doesn't do. And um, I thought, well, what a great idea. And then we, we shelved that for a while because we realized that that was a very potentially complex and there's a lot of technology to develop around that and a lot of programming and other things that would need to be addressed. So um, at that moment, uh, COVID hit and the pandemic began. And so we were all kind of left inside of our own heads in many ways. And during that period, um, uh, again, as I mentioned, Robert gave me the chance to uh, mint my first NFT, which was a uh, I thought somewhat appropriate um, to talk about because it was a piece that was disintegrating in my storage. Um, and there was a work of, in my storage, um, which I was exploring a lot during COVID, um, going back and looking at the archives and, and what was what was kind of latent old pieces, things that hadn't been fully explored. And 
in that mix was a piece that was I found when I opened a box was actually disintegrating. So I quickly tried to make a um, a, a, vid, a video and a moving image digitally, uh, digital most digitally moving um, uh, graphic image of that work and present it as the NFT as prior to the piece's destruction. So, so that now is the only uh, remnant of that piece, which is the um, which is the first NFT that I did. Um, uh, a few months later, interestingly enough, the uh, idea of, of the conversation we'd had about a generative project with Andy um, and Snarkart uh, wouldn't, it just wouldn't, um, it wouldn't leave me. So as that idea developed, it was, uh, um, um, I didn't really realize that they are also, you know, uh, the idea was not, you know, couldn't leave them either. So in many ways, when I uh, rejoined that conversation and tried to uh, bring it up again, um, they suggested that I uh, collaborate and work with someone in the field that had a uh, similar kind of interest. And you know, I was really skeptical at first with the idea of, of collaborating with someone I'd never met from a completely different sphere, who's uh, uh, Neil Krigorichko in uh, uh, digital motion graphics and who's a pretty amazing um, general uh, digital artist. Um, but again, from two totally different spheres, which I'd never, I'd never kind of considered uh, fully collaborating with before, um, I was, uh, you know, uh, kind of unsure of how we were going to work together. So it was interesting when we finally did get to meet in a coffee shops in Brooklyn during COVID and began discussing these these ideas. And I found that, you know, even though we talk about OG crystals, and I'm here talking about the center of this project. And its inception, and, on, I, and I do find many, many connections to the threads of my work uh, throughout uh, everything I've made sculpturally and performatively. And it's important to note that I think the OG Crystal project was also, unbeknownst to me, being simultaneously made by Daniil in his mind and his whole practice. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is when we met, we found that um, our interests, our concerns, our concepts, and how we were expressing them were different, but the concerns were very similar. And when we met, it became very clear when I saw a project of his called Memopod, which was a, a project in which he was taking literally information and digital uh, information streams and uh, imagining them physicalized layer after layer. And I just thought, you know, immediately that is exactly the kind of thing that I've been thinking about with how I've, I'm seeing works and uh, evolve and sculptures evolve inside of liminal spaces and inaccessible spaces underground or in demilitarized zones or or even in, in spaces in between. Um, and so um, from that conversation, it was a really healthy base to, to then uh, continue meeting and developing the idea of, of a project. And yeah. that's where I really began to learn what possibilities of NFTs. Wow, thank you. Yeah, it, it means, well, 2017, you're pretty seeing the start of the crypto world. Uh, and it's one of the questions I also had about OG crystals is you are planting those seeds and then the rest of it is given to chance. How was this part for you? Because I think it's so hard to, for an artist, especially to kind of seize control. You have the idea of what you would like the work to look, but once, once it's sold and once it goes to the first wallet, uh, it starts to evolve. It starts to grow in a way that in a, in a sense you can't control because it's influenced by the person who bought it, by the other transactions. And there's no way for you to say, stop, I like it like this. Can we just leave it as is? How was that, you know, completely giving up? Well, not completely, but at least partially giving up control. Oh, for me, it's a, I'm not too much of a stranger to letting, letting the process take over in a way. And in many of the works before, um, I often like work to, like I could see myself setting off a ball in motion and beginning a process and seeing the artworks that result or what's exhibited in a traditional sense, um, only one slice or cross section, like in a tree of a much longer kind of idea or uh, process of work. And so in many ways, the crystals are all slices of all of this activity for me. At the same time, I think that even the nature of collaborating with Daniil has a certain element of, 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 of letting go and letting go of this idea of, of expanding the idea of authorship 
or the kind of concept that there could be a kind of greater um, and larger growing um, concept and growing platform is really exciting actually. Um, one of the things in the OG crystals that happens is taking the algorithmic, taking the data from each unique um, um, crypto wallet that each collector or participant uh, has, which is again, a series of, of, of incredible unique numbers will almost uh, as a growth principle trigger uh, kind of genetic uh, you know, uh, growth in a certain way, different kinds of traits will appear. And all of these traits are just probabilities as set up and pre-rendered by Dan Daniel. And, and in many ways, we can't ever control or, or know what these unique combinations will be. But they do come from a place where that is fixed. They do come from ideas yeah. and, and principles of within science and nature, but also within the kind of aesthetic um, um, rules and aesthetic uh, uh, things that Daniel has set up. Wow. You, you said that about, you know, redoing the concept of authorship, but also the concept of ownership is very different because in this work, in a way, you have to give up ownership to allow the work to evolve. And also you can't have it, you can't own it in its entirety because the amount of seeds you could buy is limited per wallet. So if you want, uh, you, you'll only own a little bit of the whole work, right? Well, in a way that how, how it works is um, in the very beginning, um, 10,301 of these seeds were released and, um, and purchased by a public uh, and by the participants in the project. Um, each of these wallets of these, um, of these buyers what, uh, triggered the particular um, characteristics of that first generation mint and that first generation crystal then is a direct reflection of the uh, crypto wallet identification. Um, subsequent ones where each uh, next participant or buyer or owner rather um, takes the crystal on, the uh, unique characteristics of their wallet are applied. So it's a kind of growing and transforming cumulative uh, crystal up to seven times. So each of these 10,301 crystals can grow up to seven times and up to seven times um, we'll, form, we'll find a completely different and unique crystal. Or they could stop at one or two. The whole idea that what we're asking uh, the owners to do is relinquish, to let something go in order to almost set it free because in a way realizing all of these in the end um, as all 10,301 uh, crystals um, are, are essentially a collective at the end of the project or at the end of the, the growth period will be collectively reassembled physically as a sculpture. And so in a way we're trying to collectively co-create something, but at the same time, unlike I think what most NFTs do there, it's asking you to sell rather than to hold it. And so, uh, yeah. so I, I also think that, you know, if, if we're going to let something go, then the collect that I think it's in very much in parallel with how, you know, our community will have to, uh, also behave, which is also for everyone to be letting go to some extent yeah. in order to go forward. Uh, quickly, is there any symbolism behind the numbers with, uh, behind the 10,301 and the seven times that you could potentially sell the work before it stops growing? Um, 10,301 is a, you know, a lot of collections um, that are large have a 10,000 parts in the collection and Daniil and I were going through the notion of how many because we thought it was very important and everything within this because we're very detail oriented people. I think, um, you know, Daniil had the brilliant idea to um, utilize 10,301, which is a palindromic prime, which basically reads backwards and forwards um, the same way. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm perfectly, you know, as, as nerdy as he is about such things and so I could appreciate it. And so visually, it's a good match. It's, it's a good match. It's a good match. It reads backwards and forwards the same, but in many ways, it can also then talk about time because going backwards and forwards, um, you know, kind of begins to address that that idea as well. Yeah. Another symbolic uh, thing I wanted to ask about is once seventy five percent of the work is uh, completed, it goes to the uh, organization that is called the decentralized uh, autonomous organization, the DAO. 
to what extent in your practice, both with organic growth crystals, but also previously, do you um, involve your Korean heritage? Because you grew up in the States, but your parents are Korean and you do work with the community, both in Korea and in the U.S. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Uh, my question I lost was, you for a second. Oh, yeah. My question was that, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. So my question was, when 75% uh, of the work is completed, it goes to the decentralized autonomous organization, uh, the DAO. And I wanted to ask about your heritage, you being Korean, to what extent it influences your practice? Was it something that happened organically from your childhood or was it a way to rediscover your roots through your artistic practice and through engagement with community? Well, the idea of the um, DAO is, is, uh, is a kind of, um one of several outcomes along the way with this project we'd always thought one of the massive potentials um, alongside the idea of community and engagement um, is the fact that we can uh, create something that continues to develop beyond the thing itself and so at various points along what we are calling a roadmap for the project we um, would hit certain markers of percentages of participation and be able to increase the scope of the project and um, so at certain percentage point we were able to promise that we will make AR or augmented reality models of each of these crystals and we hit that marker and so it's something that we're working on right now that you know, each owner will be able to have access to literally an AR version they could use in the metaverse potentially. Another one of the outcomes at a further uh, um, kind of percentage point was the ability for us to take a certain amount of our um, um, primary sales and donate a percentage back to uh, oceanographic research. And after interviewing maybe you know, dozens and dozens of uh, potential collaborators, we uh, began working with Scripps Institute of Oceanography, both for one specific laboratory, the Smith Lab, dealing with ocean, uh, coral reef restoration and conservation, but as well as larger kinds of ideas of global warming and climate change, as well as the Benthic Invertebrates Lab, which is a laboratory that has a collection um, inspired, that it's also inspires the idea of exploration and, um, and biodiversity, things that we're also very interested in and aligned with our project. And, and one of the outcomes of that percentage point is the fact that our community is actually, at this moment, naming uh, a scientifically a newly discovered uh, species of a type of starfish. And so our community will actually have named as a community um, for the scientific record, a, a, a new species of or organism of the planet. Um, so it's going to be a, a huge vote between all the uh, members of the organic growth community. On yes. The name. Well, we, yeah, we had a huge, we had a big vote of the community and that was an early example of the community kind of beginning to collectively vote on things. And we've done that with a number of, of, of other um, aspects of the project, but is a precursor to what we're uh, to the next percentage point, which was to create this decentralized autonomous organization, which would be a governing body that would actually um, kind of help to uh, help to um, vote on and participate in the future of the, the overall project. And I, I like the idea that there's so much individual engagement with with something within the NFT space, but there's a lot of potential for a much larger collective kind of engagement as well. And so that outcome of the DAO we're testing right now as a, as, as a community fund. And so in the beginning, we're, we are doing a community fund in which we put back a percentage of our royalties and um, earnings back into the project itself that we will have our community be able to dictate and create other kinds of um, engagement that, that relates to the piece. And some of that, which is so exciting to me, relates to um, other projects, other potential creative projects that may have started as a, as a beginning point with, with OG Crystals, but goes off into other potential creators' um, you know, uh, endeavors. And all of those endeavors will be voted on and proposed by the community itself. And so we'll be able to support other creative spaces, other creative um, output through this place. And so in many ways, it's so exciting that we, you know, I think NFT space can be like a thing in a place to me, 
It's yeah. always, you know, something I aspire to within my own sculpture as well. If it's a thing in a place, then, you know, like I can use an analogy of a campfire. Um, for instance, a campfire is, is definitely something that's active and it's something yeah. where people can gather and it's identifiable as a central point and around that ideas can be, just can be had. But also it, so it is a thing, but it's also a place and a site, a site for, to generate kind of communal communality and communal ideas in a very different setting, a very primordial setting in some ways, right? Yeah. About urgency. Yeah, well, wow, that's fascinating. And did you vote on creating the physical piece? Because at the end of the growth cycle of the crystals, you will be creating AR, but also a physical printed piece. Was it a community decision to create a physical piece? No, the physical outcome uh, is always something we saw as a as part of the 100% participation at, the, at this mm -hmm. roadmap. And um, the physical was always, you know, one of the identifiable outcomes, I'd say, that was going to be this um, marker on a horizon. I don't think it's the end goal because I don't think, I, I think we were trying to, to make something that is not finite. But the idea that the sculpture could be a reflection and a, almost a group portrait of all of our activity, all 10,301 um, crystals and um, all 4,000 current owners' um, activity during this period uh, was, was really exciting. So what we uh, will be doing is making and assembling collectively one, one uh, monumental scale sculpture um, that displays every single one of the crystals. Wow, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the piece. Well, I wanted to say final piece. It's not final, but the, the physical piece, because I do enjoy having art in the physical realm still, uh, even though so much of it is digital. And can you tell me a bit more about how it was your experience working with the Hermitage? Because I see that with Snark Art and with Daniel, you had a, a very peaceful coexistence and many of the ideas you had, even before you met physically, you, um, you shared and you had the same ideas. How was it with the Hermitage? Because I think Hermitage took a great leap of faith creating this fully digital exhibition, uh, something nobody has ever really done, no major art institution in the world. How was your experience? How did you get into this project? And how has it been so far? Oh, it's been really exciting. I was really honored and thrilled that they would take on the project. And I was kind of overwhelmed, actually, that you know, it was, it's such a kind of uh, radical reimagining of space. Um, but it was also perfectly in keeping with what I imagine you know, the art world is going to have to, to do in so many ways a, a tough ask in terms of understanding or, or accepting the idea of NFTs within a, you know, some kind of aspect of art. And I think um, one of the things that's so important is that you know, I found myself is a kind of recalibration of aesthetics. You almost have to recalibrate for a space that is digital and completely intangible. Um, the idea of, of, of how things will and should and could look because they can look like almost anything as representations within that space. And, and so in many ways, as a sculptor going into the Hermitage space, I was really, you know, I was really um, concerned. I wasn't sure how, to, how I'd be able to kind of deal with that, you know, a representation inside of a representation. And what was exciting as well was the kind of call to begin to recalibrate my own aesthetics and expectations of what could be possible in there. So I think it's a work in progress as well. So, you know, I'm pretty grateful for the opportunity to just even have begun thinking about those types of spaces. And, and it was a really great introduction to me to the you know, potential of metaverse type space. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because in a way in the digital sphere, we are only limited by, by our own imagination. So as an artist working with a physical object, you have the limitations of the material and of the physical 3D uh, space that you inhabit, but here there's, there's nothing you can do as long as you can imagine it. And then the, you know, the technology can uh, catch up and try to figure out a way to make it happen. But pretty much it's our understanding of space, of aesthetics, of the feeling that guides us uh, towards how it could look. Uh, and it's interesting. Where do you see in the future? Because you were saying this is where the art uh, world will go in the future. Where do you see uh, a lot of the art exhibited? Do you feel it's going to be spaces like this? Do you think 
maybe with AR, it's going to inhabit our physical spaces throughout the world. It's a guess, of course, we don't know, but what's your well, feeling? Well, I have to say that, I mean, I think that nothing will ever replace real physical sculpture and, and painting and artwork. I think that's really important, at least for me, and I think um, to put on record as well. I think in many ways, what's happening now is also the idea of an opportunity to really kind of um, rethink uh, a, a critical moment where um, something like NFTs could be seen as, uh, you know, the uh, kind of early adoption of photography in many ways. And the idea of, you know, this type of technology um, entering into our, our art sphere. And I think as we know it, and I think art has always been ahead in many ways at being very daring in understanding what it is in our uh, physical world and how we relate to what's visual. Um, and in, in, in many ways uh, ahead, of, uh, ahead of the curve in, in, in many ways of thinking. And I think that art has always dealt uh, with intangibles as a you know, kind of um, brilliant director over at uh, Hirschhorn, Melissa Chu has pointed out, you know, that art had always dealt with intang intangibles from Marcel Duchamp to Saul Lewitt um, instructional drawings. And in many ways, there's something in NFTs that has to do with that kind of concept and belief as well. So I think what we're, what if, if NFT work is to be a part of the future, I think it's really important for us currently to understand that, you know, maybe we should begin to understand the way that future generations are going to process uh, uh, aesthetics and process visual culture are going to be completely different and recalibrated by the realities that they're experiencing within technology next generations, um, even beyond my own children's generations that are living with hand in, hand in hand, side by side with metaverses and with the types of digital social media that are and AR that are happening are going to have a completely recalibrated sense. So I think it's a really exciting time for us to kind of imagine how to empathize with that, with that future generation in many ways. And if we want to have a part in shaping that future, um, um, uh, field and, and generation uh, or uh, kind of um, sensibility, so to speak. I think that uh, this is the moment. Wow, thank you. I have quite a bit of questions, but I think I'm going to ask Sasha to tell us if there's any questions from the audience, uh, because I know we have a time limit. <laughs> yeah, but I think we just have another like 10 minutes or something about it. So, like, please, I'm asking people who are watching us now, just write their questions in the comments, because I see that a lot of people just joined us, but they are just watching. <laughs> if you have, if you want to ask something, please, let's free to do it. And uh, also one thing which I wanted to say, uh, that uh, it's uh, another, like, almost 10 days to visit uh, our, like, Hermitage uh, exhibition. So it will be available online till 10th of December. And also, I wanted to say, like, uh, express our appreciation to our partners, our digital past partner, Master Digital, our strategic partner, Axiom of Family Foundation, mm -hmm. and uh, for sure, like, all these platforms and marketplace which supported us, like OpenSea, Rarible, SuperRare, Artblocks, uh, and Dater Labs. So, I mean, if, if you will see also some questions, you, like, you can answer it, but for now, it looks like everybody is so interested in our discussion <laughs> that everybody is just listening. So I think, Daddy, you have another possibility to, to ask a few more questions. I'll, to I'll, Michael. I'll put another <laughs> question in. Uh, it's something that a lot of people uh, ask me because we, uh, we as Christie's have sold NFT uh, P art pieces, but there's also those marketplaces that don't have... Um, very strict curatorial uh, limits, so they're quite open to anybody who wants to upload their work. And I want to ask, what was your feeling on curatorship in the sphere? Because some people are saying then the whole idea of, of NFT marketplaces that anybody can join, anybody can display their art, and it's completely open to everyone. But then we are also seeing a big interest in works that I curated by Christie's. We're doing a curated by Christie's selection. Open C right now, actually it's starting today in Miami. 
So uh, what is your feeling in terms of um, curatorial view of the NFT space? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if I can speak for the curatorial side myself, but, um, you know, from the side of the of, of, of being a, a producer or a, a maker as an artist, I think it's an interesting and important that this community is being created and, and all of the groundwork uh, for the for the kind of uh, rules and structure of the space are being created with a lot of say of the uh, creators and a lot of say of the artists. And I think in some ways that might be parallel to other other times in in you know the history of of, of art as we know it in contemporary art. And um, although I wouldn't say this is necessarily you know, each one is this earth shattering moment, um, there is something very important about that. That aspect. So I think that conversation you're having is the one that is going to be the most important conversation in many ways as NFT, uh, as, as NFTs kind of begin to enter and influence and um, enter a conversation um, of contemporary art in many ways. So I hope that's not you know, too convenient a way of avoiding your answering your no, question. No, no, it's actually very interesting. And I don't personally have an answer. I see a lot of people needing the curatorial kind of guidance, but I'm yeah. also seeing some people who are saying it's, it's not, and I'm uh, interested in, I, actually from an artist's perspective, but also it's something I ask uh, some of the digital art collectors because I'm trying to see a different feeling. I'm, you know, being an art historian, I'm, I'm always for curation. I love curating things. <laughs> uh, I think we're so important as, as, as art historians. But I do understand that other people view it a little bit differently. And the artist's uh, point of view is very interesting, particularly because you're in the center of it all. Uh, we wouldn't have anything to study if, if artists weren't creating art, uh, right? Sasha, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, I think it's a great answer. Thank you. And could I just ask one question to Michael? Yeah, sure. Uh, and tell us what uh, what is your plan for Miami? Like, uh, tell us more about the event you're planning to to have tomorrow about Oji Crystals. Oh, like as I was saying in the beginning, it's been amazing seeing, you know, my art compatriots in the in the kind of um, Miami Basel art space that I'm familiar with um, from from decades, and uh, and now seeing a kind of audience that I've recently been introduced to at NFT NYC just a few months back um, in the same city at the same time and having cross-pollinating conversations. So what I'm doing right now is trying my best to navigate uh, a mixture of, of both. And at the moment, it might be that crypto engagements and events are eclipsing some of the art events, but I'm trying to see them both. And I see a lot of the same people at them. And what we plan to do here, um, I plan to come down to kind of take part and, and see some of that, as well as uh, um, listen to some conversations myself about such similar to the ones we're having right now and about NFTs and 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 their role or, or potential uh, his future with art, uh, real art world and art world as we know it. And so I'll be attending a couple events tonight and so, you know, going to see a, um, a salon for um, Bitcoin by uh, Sarah Mejohas. And uh, the other evening I saw a uh, another event with David Sally and Sarah Mejohas. Today, uh, Glenn Kaino, just to do some more pitches here. Glenn Kaino is introducing a really, really fascinating um, Pass the Baton NFT. And he is also doing a project with um, a collaborators in music. So I'm going to see any number of, of events where you know, artists that, that um, you know, are colleagues of mine working in in the field and, and great artists are actually trying to tackle NFTs as a, uh, as a medium and on, on its own terms. And I think that's, you know, for me to see that live and not just in digital space is really interesting as well. And so, you know, I'm here to take in some of that energy and, and hopefully we'll give some out tomorrow because we are doing our own event for OG Crystals um, tomorrow evening at the uh, standard on, on the dock, appropriately at the edge of the edge of the mediating dock between land and, and, and water for our OG crystals. We'll be having a little bit of a, um, a very exclusive but open event at the uh, Lido dock. Um, and so I'm quite mm -hmm. excited to see members of our community in the flesh. 
people that I've only known as handles like Biggie Stardust and Dr. Plant and such. You know, I've known I've known them as crypto handles, and now I get to see them as um, as as people in in, in person, hopefully, and uh, get to say hi and have a moment with them too. Sounds amazing. And maybe Michael, do you have any question to Daria? <laughs> of a side. Ah. Maybe you want to ask her something. <laughs> well, what do you think? I I know that we've had the the Hermitage's uh, exhibition, the Ethereal Ether. Uh, quite extraordinarily has really jumped into completely virtual space. How can you imagine, uh, which I think is an important question now, NFTs, how would they, what would it look like for them to occupy um, space of museums? How will they present it as museums, as brick and mortar, real structures? Are there other ways other than completely relegating them to d purely digital spaces that they can exist? And have you thought about that? Yeah, I've, I've thought about that, and um, I don't know if it's because I'm very much in the physical space. I'm not a very digitally savvy person. I was actually surprised how easy it was to access the Hermitage exhibition, because I was ex expecting that it'll be a disaster. I'm very bad with tech. But I, I always imagine those things being more in terms of the AR, so something that I can physically imagine uh, in a space using the AR technology and possibly interact with it because um, for me still I'm not a digitally native person the screen feels like a fourth wall that kind of blocks me from from the piece I'm used to experiencing works live and whenever I try to imagine a full-scale um, exhibition uh, I always imagine the mixture of physical objects with AR objects that allow uh, me to interact with them. And I think it's a really exciting opportunity in terms of also placing them throughout the city or having them, you know, being a bit different depending on the person who's viewing, similarly to the OG crystals being different with other, depending on the wallet of the person. Maybe something similar if we access the exhibition using our wallets the experience we have could be a little bit different and tailored uniquely to mm. um, our background in a way. It's both limiting and freeing in a, in a sense, but it's a very interesting thing to imagine how each person would interact differently because when we think of a traditional oil on canvas painting, we, we think uh, that we feel the same thing or that we interact with, with it the same way when you have three or four people standing in front of a picture and staring at it. But actually, we're having completely different experiences. It depends on the background, on our mood on that day, on everything we've known or not known about the artist. And I do teach a course in museology in the university. And I have students who have some museum experience who like to go to museums uh, on their free time, attend my lectures and my classes in the museums. Uh, and then I've had students for whom it was the first experience ever of being in a museum at 19 years old. One of my students, it was his first ever time. And the way he interacted with the objects, the way he even wandered around the spaces was very different from uh, people who had more of an experience and who maybe behaved more uh, traditionally to, as in what we're used to. But even as if we have five or six people standing in front of a painting, what's happening in their minds is completely different. They may be silently standing. We think they feel mm. the same thing. It's different. So maybe the AR, in a way, could also provide a similar experience, just more literally having the show curated to your specific eyes and uh, your specific impressions. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah. Super nice thought. So I think uh, like we had an amazing hour together discussing <laughs> NFT, OG Crystals and the Hermitage exhibition. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Daria. And uh, we're happy <laughs> to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. And Michael, have Thank an amazing you. Miami. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very have much. Have a great time in Miami. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great to speak to you both. Thanks very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.